Hi everyone, welcome to STA Skills. Uh, this is a weekly system design series. Um, we alternate on doing a deep dive on one of the system design topics one week and another week on mock interviews. So this week we are having a mock interview. So um, Itanya volunteered for an interview as an interviewee and Abhishek volunteered as an interviewer. So yeah, I mean, like the format of this is like we all uh, listen uh, as an audience and while they're interviewing for 45 to 50 minutes and uh, and then like after the mock interview, we again collectively discuss for the feedback and how we can improve together, how we can do better. So with this, I'll give forum to Abhishek and Chaitanya. Thank you, Naga. Uh, hi, Chaitanya. Uh, I'm Abhishek and I'm going to be your interviewer for today. Uh, so before we start, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how much experience do you have? So... Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Abhishek. Um, I am Chaitanya Vaikar. Um, I have close to uh, five years of experience uh, in the development of uh, enterprise applications using mostly uh, Scala and Java technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I started off as a Java developer and was in that role for around two years. And since the last three years, I have been in more or less into uh, functional programming and reactive programming. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, let's start with the system design question. So, uh, so let's say that uh, we have started a new company, new airline company and we want to build a system which is a airline reservation system airline booking system mm -hmm. so yeah. i need your help in designing that kind of a system okay um cool um, yeah before um i mean i begin are you able to see my screen yes i can see your screen okay okay so yeah so um, I'll just write airline booking system. So, uh, I mean, I, I'll start off with the functional requirements first here. Mm -hmm. Of um, so, is this airline booking system for a particular airline, or is it like an aggregation service? Uh, it's for a particular airline. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a second. Um, Um, so, uh, when I uh, talk about airline booking service, there are a lot of components involved. So first of all, um, uh, searching a flight for a particular date, yeah. um, and then, um, maybe, maybe booking the airline and then, um, I mean, the additional services that come along with booking the airline. So do we require all these uh, requirements in our website? Yeah, so like uh, uh, some of the components we can borrow and we can say they have been already built, like our authentication system and the payment system. We can say that we have APIs for that. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, otherwise... Otherwise, as you mentioned, searching for flights or booking the flights, that is something that we're going to design. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm um, searching and booking. Fine, so um, when I say, uh, I mean, when we book the flight, we make the payments. So uh, are we going to build a payment service of our own or are we using some third party uh, um services like stripe or something yeah we can use a third party service okay um i'm thinking more about the functional requirements so, so once i now book the ticket um uh, the flight ticket so uh, should i have a, i mean should the system have a provision of um having some additional services like cab from the airport or hotel booking along with the flight bookings? Mm, not, no, we don't need that. Okay, uh, fine. 
and um, in this airline booking system do we uh, i mean as soon as i book the ticket i should uh, the user should receive the notification so are we looking at some notification service here also that's a good question yeah we can make it like p1 like uh, not not important right now later if we have time we can discuss this okay fine uh, i'll just make it optional here and uh, do we need some kind of analytic service also on top of this yeah again a good question yeah this yeah it it's optional for now okay okay um hmm. I'm just thinking if I'm missing any of the functional requirements here or uh, what all things. I mean, this is just a booking website for a single airline. So yeah. um, I don't think there will be a lot of, um, I mean, we don't need to contact different endpoints and fetch the latest information regarding a flight. So uh, for our airline, we'll, uh, we ourselves own the data uh, mm -hmm. for the the flight bookings, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool, cool. So, yeah, I mean, I am done with the functional requirements. Mm -hmm. Probably I'll move to uh, the non-functional requirements here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so sorry, uh, before I begin, uh, out of uh, these, uh, I mean, the first four functional requirements uh, that I have mentioned, um, do you want me to include any other um, feature here that I have missed off or any particular feature uh, we, uh, I mean, you would like to have or priority for any of the features? Uh, uh, no, I think it looks good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. Then coming to the non-functional requirements side. Um, I would like to know how many number of uh, bookings or uh, what is the traffic of the website? Like how many users will be using the platform? Um, yeah, so we can say that we are a really popular airline company. Like we give people really good uh, service and so a lot of people come to us. So. Uh, Let's say we have hundred thousand users every day. Okay, hundred k users per day, and um, so these are num these are the number of users visiting our website daily. These uh, these could you can say number of calls, uh, number of people who are searching for airlines. Okay, number of. And uh, what are the number of bookings that uh, our platform can have or the transactions? Uh, the transactions, yeah. So transactions would be uh, lower. Uh, so you can say 1,000 transactions per day. Okay. Um, yeah, that looks good. So. Uh, like, like a typical application, uh, uh, I mean, it's very read heavy than write heavy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, how many flights are we offering uh, for, I mean, uh, the number of, so there are two um, main users here. First of all, the end user or the customer who is booking the flight and also the airline owner who adds his own flight listings. Mm -hmm. We, yeah, we are the airline owner, so we can, yeah, we can say that, uh, like, let's say we have, uh, so to simplify things, let's say we have 100 flights which run every day all across the world, right? Okay. And those 100 flights, let's say, have 250 seats. Mm -hmm. so on that basis, you can do the calculation, like. Okay, fine. Um, I'll just write hundred per day, and Oops. Okay, and um, do we 
require our website to be highly available? Highly available, yeah. We want it to be highly available, yeah. Okay, and uh, in terms of uh, latency or uh, do we have any strict requirements regarding how fast the API call should be or I mean, um, any any expected uh, metric here? Yeah, uh, no, I mean, overall, we would want to have low latencies. Okay. And um, so the, the users uh, who will be booking these uh, flights, so um, will they be booking using a website or is it an app? Or I mean, how will the users be booking um, the flights? Uh, let's start with the website. Okay. Clients are the sign website. Okay. So these, uh, the questions that you have asked about highly available latency. So mm -hmm. do you have different components, right? You said that, uh, there will be a feature of searching the flight. There will be a feature of booking the flight. So do right. you think they apply to all, all of them similarly or like some components might have these, uh, these variables differently? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a good question. So definitely, um, what, as we have a heavy load of users here, uh, it makes um, sense to actually split up our services and uh, have a more uh, service oriented architecture. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm planning to have microservices here so that we can uh, scale up or scale down a particular components. And mm -hmm. that's why, I mean, these metrics will be helpful uh, to us. Um, uh, I mean, once I start designing the different services or different uh, features here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, just one last question from my side. So um, this website, I mean, the users from anywhere in the world can book uh, yeah. the tickets. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have, yeah. That's a good question. We have like international users. Fine. Um, I guess I I don't have any further um, questions here regarding the non-functional requirements. But if I have something, I'll clarify it um, through the interview. Um, okay, I'll just move it to a corner. One question, Chaitanya, before we move forward. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk anything about consistency? Ah, yeah. Right. Sorry. I forgot about that. Definitely. Uh, so as um, payments are involved here, um, we I would definitely like to have, um, uh, I mean, a highly consistent um, database um, or something that that is asset compliant to deal with the payment structure here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. I just want to mention one thing here that uh, can you have a system which is like highly available and highly consistent? Um, and no, I mean, no, because for us, the requirement is the users are, um, I mean, they are booking from all over the globe. So mm -hmm. um, it would be difficult to have both of these things together. Okay. Uh, so how, why booking across the globe makes it difficult to have both highly available and highly consistent? Yeah, sure. Because if, uh, I mean, if we want to be highly available and highly consistent at the same time, then uh, we would not be, able, I mean, we will lose uh, the ability to partition our data. So, um, I mean, to achieve both of these constraints, we will be losing our third ability to um, have the data across multiple um, data centers. 
Mm-hmm. So, so if uh, if my users were in one region only, so you you said the uh, uh, if because we have users in multiple region, we need to partition the data. If I have users, let's say in one region, then do you need to partition your data uh, overall system? Uh, no, sorry. I mean, um, I'll, I'll I'll rephrase uh, here. I went a bit wrong. So, um, I mean, it depends on the number of uh, users that we have uh, right now. So, it it would not affect uh, from wherever we are accessing. Uh, the, I mean, the website. Okay. Okay. So even if from one, from one region we have let's say ten million users or something, then definitely it would not be feasible to store all of them in a single machine. So we would need to think of strategies to um, basically, uh, de- I mean, partition the data. Uh, so w- what is the difficulty in storage? Like uh, if we have, uh, like why do you think that storage will be a problem? Um, I mean, th- there's a limit till which we can uh, vertically scale a system, right? So, um, so how much? Yeah, how much storage do you think do you, you need uh, for this to store this information? Okay, uh, so you want a rough capacity estimation here regarding the data? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, So I'll, I'll again start writing here. Um, uh, so regarding the metrics of a user, um, I mean, I, I would like to ask what uh, data are we capturing for the user or is there any specific uh, um, data size that we have for particular attributes? you can make assumptions so yeah so like what is what are the attributes you want to store okay um yeah i mean um, for uh, for any particular user let's um, we'll definitely be having uh, the basic info um like the first name last name the the uh, the payment information for the user mm-hmm. um so yeah so let's say all that information could be stored for a user in let's say 100 bytes yeah fine mm-hmm. um so yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I should have asked how many number of users are there in the system. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> I just asked about number of people searching the airlines, but definitely um, this was something so, that I missed here. So like, what do you mean by how many users? So the, uh, the thing I mentioned is how many people are searching, right? So the people who are searching for your airlines, do you need to store any information for them? Uh, no. Um, if, for, for people who are searching the airlines, I mean, they might be just uh, as a guest login trying to search the website, but uh, they might not be actual users. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So then what uh, are you looking to ask? about the users, the users who are like, who are our members who are, who have accounts. Yeah. Or uh, the total number of users that we might have in the future or some target that we have in mind regarding the number of users. Yeah. yeah. We can take an, an assumption there. So let's say we have, uh, let's have 10,000 users uh, in our account. Okay. And yeah, and uh, you can consider that every year, let's say we have ten percent growth. Okay. Yeah. Then, then that's a pretty small number for uh, the number of 
users. So definitely it can be stored in a single database. I mean, we don't uh, uh, need to think a lot about how we will, uh, um, I mean, store and partition our data and so on. So uh, let's say I'll just do the math. Um, 10K. Yeah, so that is almost uh, one GB, 976 MB, uh, the capacity, almost one gigabyte of data uh, for storing the number of users right now. And even if we consider, um, I mean, how many years should we save the data for the number of users? Five years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so one GB plus, let's say, uh, five. So I'll, I'll consider overall seven GB in five years. Okay. Um, yeah. So okay, you, you are saying this information could be stored in single machine, right? So. Yeah. Now this information could be stored in single machine. So now can we make our system both highly available and highly consistent? Like, do we need to distribute our system? Uh, yeah, I mean, the moment uh, we will start thinking about distributing the system. So, um, uh, I mean, one of the parameters, either availability or consistency will take a hit. So uh, regarding the number of users, we we should be highly available than highly consistent. So I guess it would be fine uh, if we are eventually consistent for the at least a user service for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you would prefer availability over consistency. Uh, okay, we, yeah, let's discuss more about this. But first I want to know that do you need to build a distributed system in this scenario? Because you said your data could fit in a single machine, right? So now do you think we need a distributed system or we can use a single machine? Um, I mean, there are, I mean, in real life situations, there are situation uh, scenarios wherein the number of users using a platform uh, just shoot up, uh, let's say there's some viral event or something. So uh, keeping all those things in under consideration, it is always uh, good to have uh, the data distributed and have the strategies in place for that. Uh, okay, so given the metrics we have right now, right? You can see all the metrics. Yeah. Let, forget about any spikes or anything. Looking at the metrics now, will you create a distributed system or will you keep a single node system? Yeah, definitely. I'll go for a distributed system here. Uh, and what is the metric? Like, why do you need, looking at these metrics, why do you think you need a distributed system? Um, I mean, um, the number of users are always increasing and we don't have a specific timeline that we will delete the previous users that we have. Um, I mean, the users can stay onto the platform for a long time. Plus it, uh, there's also flexibility to add more uh, or maybe store more data related to a user. So our initial consideration of hundred bytes might go up as our system evolves. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, let's move forward, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, um, should I start with the searching, um, a phase first or maybe the booking? Uh, whatever you feel more comfortable with, I'm okay with anything. Okay. Um, let's, I'll, I'll start with the search first. So um, let's say um, this is, this is the user here. Um, 
so I, I would uh, I would prefer to have an HTTP uh, communication between the client and our servers. So uh, the the user here will connect to one of our um, um, front end applications or front end servers uh, through the load balancer. Um, So uh, when I say load balancer, this load balancer will um, have all the functionality regarding authentication, authorization, and also a reverse proxy. Um, once uh, I'll just write it's a HTTP um, communication between uh, these clients um, for searching the, the airlines. Uh, we can have a search service here uh, that will basically receive a request from the load balancer. So uh, now uh, we would always like to have our search as fast as possible. So um, instead of reading directly from the uh, database, uh, the search service can read from um, uh, some kind of um, uh, clusters like elastic search cluster or a solar cluster. So let's say I have um, all, all my database here. Um, so instead of directly communicating with the database, the search service can uh, communicate with an elastic search cluster. So um, this, I mean, the Elasticsearch cluster will basically add indexes on top of the existing fields and uh, for any given uh, combination regarding the dates, uh, the available seats and so on, the search service will be able to fetch records pretty quickly. So we can have multiple instances of this search service um, that will read uh, data continuously from this Elasticsearch cluster. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Any questions? Yeah. Do you have to any? Do you have anything else to add to the search service? Um, yeah, actually, I was uh, thinking of having uh, an in-memory cache here, something like Redis, um, to fetch maybe because there might be few flights which have very high frequency, or users might be looking at them, uh, looking for the availability of those flights. So I um, I mean, it would be a good idea to have an in-memory cache here um, somewhere and maybe something like Redis. Redis is just an example. We can have any in-memory cache here, uh, Redis or memcache um, and some high frequency, um, web, I mean, flights we can search through this Redis, but definitely um, this Redis, uh, needs to be updated um, via some um, messaging queue. I, I mean, I'll, I'll come back, I'll come to that later. So let's say once a booking is done, then how we should proceed and so on. But I guess uh, from a search perspective, um, it looks good to me. Uh, do you want me to talk on any specific uh, block here or I mean, please let me know how I should. Uh... I have to know that uh, why are you, you using Elasticsearch? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can either use an Elasticsearch cluster or any other uh, cluster. Uh, the thing is, um, Elasticsearch adds index on top of uh, a lot of um, columns, uh, I mean, a lot of things that we want to already search on. So uh, if we add all those indexes on top of database, then uh, most of the times it becomes quite slow. The queries become quite slow. And that's when, um, Elas I mean, something like Elasticsearch comes very handy here. So it enables quick index searching on all the fields. That's why I use an Elasticsearch here. So, uh... So why would we not be able to do it with the database index, the indexes that databases has? And uh, why you index 
the, like those multiple columns in the database, whatever you need to index on. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, definitely data database can uh, do, I mean, database already have indexes on top of them. But mm -hmm. the thing is, as our, um, I mean, as we go on adding the number of flights and um, I mean, uh, the number of parameters on which we want to search because through our website, the users can filter by a certain, um, um, by certain fields. Um, I mean, the, the query can be, uh, I mean, the search query can be by a variety of fields. So uh, we cannot actually add indexes on top of all columns uh, for a particular flight. And adding a lot of indexes on top of database will make the database query quite slow. So instead of putting the burden on the database, what we do is we add another uh, um, cluster here or solar cluster uh, in which we only add indexes there. Okay, and like, are there any issues with the sync of this elastic yeah. index? Sure, work? sure. Yeah, there there are issues uh, that um, the, uh, the I mean, these search clusters are eventually consistent. They are not highly consistent. So. Um, I mean, as soon as a change in database has been made, a similar change needs to be made in the, in the, in the search cluster there. So let's say a ticket has been booked immediately in the next second, uh, we won't be seeing this, this updated information in the searching cluster. So um, it takes some amount of time to, uh, to I mean, reflect those changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, probably I'll, I'll move to uh, the next part that is booking, uh, booking a flight. So yeah. I'll add. So let's say, um, the client uh, decides to uh, book a ticket. I'll again, he'll again, I uh, use the same HTTP, um, communication protocols. Um, let's say um, the request will again go through a load balancer here. And um, so when we make a booking, there are um, two possibilities. Either it can be a user who is making a booking or we can also make the booking in guest mode. So um, let's say I have a booking service here. Um, so this, um, one second, I'll just scroll this and move it a bit up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the booking service is kind of an aggregation service that will check, uh, whether the seat is available for that particular flight. And if it is available, then, uh, we will have to do some kind of, um, I mean, an optimistic lock on that seat and, uh, we will basically delegate that request to a payment service to do the require, required payment. So um, let's say uh, this is the, the, the database that has uh, the flight information and uh, it will check for the seats here, let's say for example, and then delegate the request to the payment service. Uh, the payment service is responsible for talking to uh, maybe third party APIs here uh, for payment. And then probably once a, once a booking, uh, once, the, once a payment is successful and a booking is done, we need to somehow, I mean, uh, we need to reflect these changes in the search service. So we can add uh, 
an in memory messaging queue sorry not in not an in memory we can we need to add a messaging queue here so that whatever bookings have been made they are reflected to other systems so, uh, so that they can reflect the new changes so i mean this booking service can communicate directly to uh, i'll i'll take maybe kafka here or any any messaging queue uh, sorry not kafka I'll, maybe just a uh, messaging queue and i mean uh, we can have uh, a consumer here uh, that will listen for events from this messaging queue and update the appropriate data in the database or even directly in the elastic search cluster there so uh, the database that you have for booking and the database that you have for search are they different um no i mean it's it's the same so uh, actually i would have have to um make a lot of arrows that's why i just made a different database here but yeah i mean it's it's the same so i don't know how to join this from here so if this database is same then why do you need this like message queue to oh sorry yeah uh, it, it's a different database because both are different services so uh i mean in a in a microservices based approach um we need to have different databases so can we like can we do an example like what is the information being stored in database for search and what is the information being stored in database for booking yeah sure um I mean, ideally, I it's the same data. Um, yeah, sorry. I mean, I was confused a bit there. Is is the same table? So, if it's same data, then do you need this message queue and this thing, or you don't need it? Ah, uh, no, I don't. I don't require it. Um, I mean, this messaging queue will, might be used for some other, um, maybe notification service or analytics or whatever we want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll just say that. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. No problem. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so the next thing I want to ask you is about. Uh, the distribution of data so you said that uh, we need to like how are we how, how are you going to actually distribute your data uh, is it going to be stored on one db machine or is it going to be stored on multiple um i mean it uh, we um, should be saving the data on multiple systems um so so how are you going to then divide your data? How are you going to? Um, I mean, uh, when it comes to data, there are multiple um, entities involved here regarding the data. So I'll, I'll just um, list down here. So uh, first of all, there's the users, uh, the flights. Um, the payment related information um, yeah. yeah i mean most of it is already um covered here um, so i mean uh, regarding the 
the flights uh, first of all um so there are just 100 flights per day and uh, even if i multiplied for a year it's not that many number of flights mm-hmm. um but i mean along in the flights information we also have uh, we need to store metrics regarding the seats and all those things so um I mean, it can be further normalized, but yeah. Sorry, um, can I, can you please uh, ask the question again? So, is seat a metric? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, we. Um, I mean, inside every airline, we have uh, different seat numbers, so we also need to capture which for which seat the booking has been done. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. My quick question is, so you are, okay, so I think what you're saying is this information can fit on a single machine. So then are you going to then like, and, but you said that you are going to build a distributed system. So how are you going to distribute, like, are you going to distribute the data or is it the same data on these machines? If it can fit on a single machine. Um. Uh, no, I mean it can. I mean uh, it cannot fit on a single machine. Um, we need to have. Uh, I mean, first of all, the data will be replicated, and definitely um, uh, we need to divide the data. I mean, basically shard the data before storing it. And why is that? But we just now calculated that it could fit on a single machine, right? Yeah, but um, and uh, yeah. So let's say. I don't, there is, so for a moment, consider that we don't have any increases, like we don't get increase in, like on an average, we will, we have this many flights because in future, if the things increase, then in future we can distribute and think about it. But right now I don't want to pay a lot of cost, right? So looking at the requirements right now, because I have started a new company and I'm also on I'm also on budget on how much money I can spend. So do you think that like, do like I should distribute and shard the data or I can live without sharding the data? Um, I mean, yeah, given our constraints or at the situation that we are in, uh, I guess um, it's not huge amount of data that can't fit on a single cluster. So mm-hmm. we can live with this. So you will, uh, okay, so then like you do have one, like one machine serving your request? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the data on one machine or? Uh... So now the data can fit in one machine, right? We have established this. So now can, now do we want to, now, so now that data is hosted on that, let's say one machine, one database, right? So are all the requests going to that one machine? Uh, so I, I would just like to clarify uh, one thing here. So, um, I mean, the, the users related information, the flights and the payment, I mean, uh, we should store them on um, separate machines. So uh, it should not be on a single machine. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so, le- uh, so m- let's say the assumption is, oh, in terms of size, all that information could fit on a single machine, mm-hmm. right? So now, would you use different machines to store this information, or you'll use one machine? Uh, no, I'll still use uh, different machines because I would like to replicate the data. So even if uh, I mean, even if we take any RDBMS, so uh, we can follow a master slave architecture there to okay. have a copy of the data. Okay, so you are okay. So you are replicating the data. Got yes. it. So, so let's say now we have this replicated. So you, we are saying that we have same data, right? And mm-hmm. it's replicated across multiple machines, right? Yeah. Okay. So then, how are you going to div- like? How are you going to divide and load balance it? Um, I, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm not getting your question exactly here. So 
uh, what's the use case of replication? Why are you replicating your data? I mean, um, our, our system is more read heavy system. So uh, I don't, I mean, if all the requests are going down to master continuously, so it will eventually bring down master. Um, right. That's why we need a slave that will have a copy of the same data. Right. So now let's say you have one master and let's mm -hmm. say you have five slaves, right? So now when a request come, how will you decide which out of these total six nodes, which nodes sh should it go to? Oh yeah. Right. So, um, definitely if, if, um, uh, I mean, we need to configure it, uh, based on the service. So let's say if we have a search service, then, um, I mean, we need to, I mean, we either add a small load balancer in front of the database there so that, uh, based on the request, it goes to the, one of the slave nodes. And once, uh, if you are having a booking request, then it should direct, I mean, it should go through the master. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So you are bringing a load balancer here to distribute your load. Yeah, or else, I mean, uh, because the, the machines, uh, I mean, if, if they are always static, then we can straight away configure them uh, in the services itself to call a specific uh, node. But I mean, in, in real life scenarios, we never know when one of the slave might go down. So um, in such cases, something like a load balancer in front of the DB will help us there. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So now, yeah, let's move on. Uh, so now, uh, now considering the situation that our, uh, data cannot fit on a single machine, right? Our mm -hmm. data size has increased. So now how will you shard your data? Um, so first of all, I, I would like to ask, uh, which, um, I mean, which entity, uh, the, the data related to which entity is exceeding our requirements or any, I mean, it's all for all. Um, so the number of users have increased, uh, like flights, the number of flights we are serving have, in, have increased. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so basically all, all the aspects as the flights increase, as the users increase, then mm -hmm. like because all of the components, all of your storage components are dependent on that. So all of them will increase, right? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, probably uh, once the, the scale changes, it's always a good uh, strategy to relook at the existing um, um, uh, database or tools that we have. So let's say if our scale is increasing, uh, then um, for, for payment related information where we need the transactional data, um, or where we need transactions, uh, we can follow a multiple master strategy, uh, there. Um, but for other entities, like let's say users and, uh, maybe flights, uh, we can go ahead. I mean, Flights can still fit on the RDBMS, but for users, if users are going way beyond uh, uh, things that fit on a single uh, machine, then we can shard the users um, based on maybe the user ID or user key or something. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, so yeah. So let's. Uh, so I, I want to ask a few questions. So you said your uh, your payment system has to be a transactional system and that's why it has to be a multi-master system. What do you mean by multi-master system here? Uh, yes. So, um, I mean, once, uh, once the load on a particular, uh, um, system, uh, I mean, let's say, a tip, uh, one box of RDBMS increases, then, uh, we need, we need a strategy wherein we distribute the load uh, between, uh, I mean, for, we distribute the load for this particular master. 
and that's where i mean either we have um i mean a multiple master strategy mm -hmm. um or else i mean i don't remember the second strategy there but um yeah i mean there are disadvantages also uh, for this particular approach that there continuously needs to be a sync service between both of them uh so multiple masters you are storing you are using uh, to replicate or what's the use like why do you need multiple masters are the multiple masters for same data or are you saying that the data which is sharded so that sharded data each one of them have their masters and that's what you are referring to multiple masters uh no um sorry i mean I, i don't know if i was able to explain it correctly i'll, I'll rephrase uh, what i was saying so um i mean first of all our our data is sharded right so uh, based on the user id it will be going to a respective system so i mean even if hello yeah i'm listening yeah okay sorry some i heard some other noise but yeah it's fine um so, yeah so if even if the load increases that that would not be a problem because it will be going to a different uh, machine to a different node mm -hmm. so in this case, yeah okay i mean in this case so okay let's move forward let's say you have sharded the data and then you are uh, so like first thing you need to figure out is like what shard you need to go to get the data right mm -hmm. uh, but okay let's say we have figured that out so one another question i had is is your booking system transactional system or is your payment system only transactional system um my my payment system is only a transaction system so um not transactional yeah. sorry booking system is not transactional i mean booking system is transaction but the main i mean fr from a whole system what uh, only when we do the booking that's when we require a highly consistent state that either the seat has been booked or it's it has not been booked um, okay so um i mean we can have strategies for storing uh, the payment related information if even that is exceeding a particular um uh, i mean if it exceeds the limits for a particular database let's say mm -hmm. okay so your booking service uh, and so how are you going to make a booking service transactional how can you make sure that uh you don't face any issues when you get multiple requests in your booking service booking the same seat yeah so um i mean we can follow optimistic locking here in booking service so um like let's say we get a request to book a ticket so uh we can just uh, assume or place a soft lock on that seat and assume that it has been booked for the for, uh, for next maybe 5 or 10 minutes mm -hmm. and wait for the payment to happen if the payment was not successful automatically the the lock will be removed okay so what do you mean so in the meanwhile your uh seat is logged will you mark it as like if if i am if someone else is viewing those seat will they be shown as booked or i will not be able to view the view the status of the database like will my database will not be unavailable or will it show that the ticket has been booked uh i mean it, it temporarily it will show that the ticket has been booked it i mean it is not available at the moment uh so see i'm saying there could be two approaches right one is that your database is logged and you like nobody is able to read any information right ah okay yeah mm -hmm. i yeah so i yeah. i got your question uh mm -hmm. so definitely we'll show it as booked so um i mean lock will be 
there, there, will, there won't be any lock there. So it will assume that the ticket was booked. Okay. So you will assume that the ticket is booked. Yes. And then. Only after, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Okay. So then if I'm reading, I will see the ticket as booked. And if someone is not able to complete the payment, then you will again mark that ticket as available. Right. So that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So I, I think we are almost on, on the time. Like we are, uh, we are past uh, 55 minutes. Do you have to add anything else to, to the system? Do you... oh, sorry. I, can you repeat the last sentence? No, I'm saying that we are almost done. I'm almost done with the interview. Do you want to add anything else to to this or are you good? Um, yeah, I mean, um, actually, I, I left this. I mean, once the ticket is booked, um, I, I just left this um, system here as I mean, the, the, the queue here as it is. So uh, we can basically add a lot of uh, more insights. I mean, this uh, information can be fed into different systems and we can have the optional features like um, mm -hmm. notifications and maybe feeding it to some uh, analytics service and so on. So this was just the last part, which uh, I mean, we could have done here. I mean, just adding a small consumer here mm -hmm. that will um, take the data and I mean, based on the type of event, it will react. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Chaitanya. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. And thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, this was a good discussion. So now let's uh, open up uh, this to an audience to see, like, um, like, to see what feedback we have. Um, anyone like to share their feedback, whether good or bad? You could even say good things, I mean, like whatever things you have noticed or like anything you see missing. I can go. Uh, yeah. Hey, folks. Uh, hey, Chaitanya. Hey, Abhishek. Uh, great interview, by the way. We learned a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I love the diagram and use of this whiteboard. So good job there. A uh, couple of things, sir. Uh, I think uh, Chaitanya was hitting the right point, uh, at least uh, in the cap theorem, that we cannot get both the availability as well as consistency. We'll have to sacrifice one of them. So that was bang on. But I think some parts of this systems uh, were really focused on the consistency aspect. And that's what uh, Abhishek was also, I think, pointing to. So, uh, and I think in this particular system, consistency, the strong consistency aspect of uh, the system, uh, the optimistic locking, which you guys talked about a little bit at, towards the end, I, I, I felt that maybe that would have been a meaty piece of this whole uh, interview. So maybe something to, uh, like uh, ponder on but uh, yeah other than that really uh, um, good points uh, separating out the payment services in a uh, different uh, third party api so good job with the requirements gathering as well um so yeah uh, overall i learned a lot and felt really good about this interview. okay thanks for me that was a good feedback Yes, um, um, more, more, man. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think, uh, thank you, Chetana and Abhishek. It was a good interview. I have a uh, few comments. Uh, I think uh, the interview starting was very strong. The re functional requirements uh, collection, especially the point trying to say, hey, what actors involved, right? So not just the users, but is it airline company? Uh, uh, you know, is are we different building a system where they're getting from airline company or we're building aggregation. So there's some good clarifications um, overall. Uh, just one comment on that front. I think, uh, you know, in the system design, right? So I think time management is is crucial. 
So I felt like uh, I think uh, typically for requirements, clarification, and all of that, I think uh, use the, the good time line is like five to seven minutes, because I think uh, that um, I think we went a little bit, but just 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 general comment. I think it's not really anything serious. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, um, so one thing is I think the some kind of high level design. I think it should have come little earlier. I think it came little later. Uh, the re the reason I say that is because the rest of the it it, it I felt like some of the it, like a detailed discussion happened before we we even had a kind of high level design. Um, it's okay, but the only thing is if you have some high level diagram in place, you have components. Then when you have discussions about uh, you know any deep, I think it will help to guide those discussions, right? Uh, any anything uh, you know trade offs, you know or anything the constituency things like that. So that's just one comment. And one more thing is, uh, when we use availability and uh, consistency, uh, I think it's what I see, most of the times I see is that they're being thrown out very general terms. I think it's better to spell out what it means in this uh, specific uh, example, right? So for us, basically, availability means that we want, uh, because it's the revenue generating service, we want to have this service always available for reads, no matter what, right? And uh, as same thing, uh, um, in, uh, I think for consistency perspective, there are, uh, I think I see in overall discussion, I see some confusion between isolation versus consistency, right? Consistency plays in a role really if, if when we go to a distributed system. I think uh, I think uh, Abhishek was trying to take this discussion from a single, piece, single computer to a distributed system, right? In the beginning, when you talk about uh, in, in a single computer, or just a single computer, it is more about isolation. If you have reads and writes are going to the same database, right? So if you lock the database, right? So in that case, the reads, you know, you'll not be able to reads, right? So so um, um, so so I think uh, we should talk about uh, kind of um, you know like write availability from that uh, perspective. Uh, consistency it comes into picture only you start replicating, you know, uh, or you start making distributed system. So yeah, I feel like we should have, uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, um, trying to go for both uh, highly available, highly consistent, consistent, um, available, important, but consistent, I think, uh, can take a little hit. I, I think as later came out the opportunity locking, right? So mm -hmm. meaning, even if you like, let's say you book a ticket for uh, 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 book a seat for two people, I think it's uh, sometimes I think it's uh, it, to generate more revenue. It may be better because. You can probably uh, you can send a cancellation to you know uh, the guy who couldn't you could only finally even if two people try to book same same seat you know if only one succeeds right um, so probably like you can fail to other user right and and you can send an offline email so um, so from that perspective I think consistency can take a, a little hit uh, and uh, so last few points is. Um, the, the opportunity clocking was definitely a good point. Um, but I think as, as I said earlier, there was a uh, confusion between that um, isolation and uh, consistency. So when we uh, talked about um, uh, locking, it's, it's, it's purely from the isolation perspective, right? So how, how you let uh, two people not uh, book the same uh, seat. Okay, so so it's so a isolation level from that. Uh, and the way opportunity work basically is that you let two concurrent transactions go in parallel and, and you use basically a sna kind of snapshot isolation and each write uh, writes to a specific uh, you know, uh, snapshot. And then at the time of transaction commit, that's when only one transaction succeeds, other transaction fails and you fail the transaction. Okay, so that way you're not locking the uh, database uh, you, and, and you're able to uh, provide a good write and, 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 and uh, read throughput. So I, I think that, that's why the, transact, the, the um, optimistic um, uh, locking was important. And one last point was that the transaction, I think uh, Abhishek was a very good point about the transaction. I think the transactions are important for uh, the booking system because when you uh, try to book, right, you may book one ticket, uh, one seat, two seats, you can book a number of seats, right? So you can imagine multiple user trying, users are trying to book. Then each, you know, each booking, since it consists of multiple seats, uh, either, either 
you should be able to book all the tickets or you fail everything right so and and uh, that's why you need the transaction uh, semantic so that each user is uh, is like uh, in in, the, in in each transaction you're trying to like uh, book multiple tickets and then you book other transaction books both go in, can go in, 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 uh, concurrently uh, because we're using opportunistic uh, uh, opportunistic um, you know uh, semantics at the time of commit right only one will succeed and then that's the one you get, you reserve the tic- uh, uh, really book the ticket for um, uh, seats for and 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 uh, and, and the other uh, other transaction will fail because they uh, at the time of commit they realize oh someone else did it right so I, I think that so i think that becomes important the transaction semantic but combined with the uh, uh, opportunistic log, opportunistic uh, uh, you know snapshot based isolation Uh, will improve overall uh, read and and uh, write throughput uh, but in this overall i think in this case uh, i think the like sharding and other things it is a little bit tricky because uh, you know i think we we couldn't really based on the capacity estimation right we couldn't really see a need for you know a lot of computers so so i think that, i think that's why i think maybe in this discussion i think more energy should have been spent on the database design kind of entity modeling how the tables look like once you have that i think the the discussion have been even more smoother so that's what i feel like yeah and uh, chaitanya would you mind uh, sharing uh, keep sharing so that like uh, people have that context to share feedback uh, sorry sorry yeah yeah no problem thank you um okay thanks uh, oh, man that was a very good feedback hi abhishek and chaitanya this is uh, this is praveen here um i think you did a good job in uh, analyzing or breaking down the problem into smaller chunks um one thing uh, i found that uh, where you kind of uh, kind of little bit hesitated was using the events and queues um and then that's where i found till that point you were going pretty smooth and then suddenly when we were pushing you kind of like uh, change your design or uh, said that uh, i might have gone this route so just look into that area where you were um when the interviewer questioned you you kind of completely erased or changed the design what i feel is uh, here in this kind of approach right every time an event comes um, they should always uh, i believe in uh, events being uh, sent and captured even for search or uh, when you're creating queues should be created for offline analysis and everything so even though that will help for your non functional 5 uh, and 6 uh, always every time you call a service for search or for booking every time a call it's kind of like logging right you want to log everything Mm-hmm. how many transactions come so depending on that you can actually send that events to the queue and later on analyze uh, based on your situation so you could have covered it up that way and justified your kafka queue or rabbit and queue or something because uh, mm-hmm. many of the big systems they don't want to lose the transactions and they should have the repeatability or analyze what actually went wrong and and they can also do a reconciliation between um the service uh, directly hitting the db or whether there was any hit and miss uh, due to network latency in any of those hops so they can have those kind of reconciliation also if you have same transaction sending the events along with your logging to splunk and other things which happens automatically but sending the in big big companies right expedia or you know any of the transactions they always actually send it to the queues and that is also used for auditing so that's one thing i you were going the right path but you kind of like stopped and erased it uh, that's all you feel but other than that i think i like the way you started with search and booking but i would say uh, uh, booking you in the functional requirement you said booking first and then we started with search searching for a particular airline um just order it little bit and then give a high level picture first as was mentioned by mohan 
that's always good to get a high level picture and then drill down into areas in which the interviewer wants you to focus on whether it's the schema designs for the databases or whether it's a load balancers or it's a, which cluster you want to go round robin or you know whether it's for uh, isolations or transactions race conditions so depending on if the interviewer feels that you're already strong in that and he wants to check some areas he can pick that one area and dig deeper into it so that way um, once you give a big picture he can just pinpoint which areas he is interested maybe that team is only interested in that part of the service uh, breaking down i like the initial uh, functional non functional optional and capacity estimation uh, which is very good i think everyone should follow that as a template uh, for future uh, interviews but overall good job if i was interviewer i'd be very happy with you thank you yeah thank you so much uh, thank you pravin um, anyone else like to go um naga if uh, mm. can i ask few questions i mean if uh, I'm... yeah yeah sure 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 yeah, yeah. uh first of all abhishek really um, it was a really good interview i would say and uh you pressed on a lot of topics which um to be very frank i was just jumping here and there and i i mean i went too much into the details and failed to see the overall big picture afterwards so um i would like to know more from an interviewer's perspective uh, yeah we will actually get the feedback as well like okay. um, yeah myself as him and like even abhishek will give the in, uh, feedback at the end we were just thinking like if someone else has some feedback like if you have some questions you can throw in or like maybe you can just hold on um, so that like we can finish feedback and then you can share so okay yeah sorry sir sure sorry. yeah yeah no problem okay so i don't know like let me give my brief feedback um what i things that i noticed i mean like the good job definitely like as everyone said like the way you captured the functional non functional requirements like you did pretty good job there and um, one of the optional items that i would add on is like whether um, like most airlines also have partners so that is also like kind of optional but like i am sure like abhishek would have made it optional so not required and uh, yeah the time little i think it went over like about 10 minutes in non functional but it still was okay at that point for me but like i think one point like uh, during the capacity estimation i thought like you were not quite comfortable chaitanya so i mean like you made some assumptions like user 100 bytes like number of users i think i was trying to give inputs here so i mean like if you are doing this capacity estimation i think like um, um i mean like the way how you arrive at 1 gb per year should um, be key so it's not that you just make an assumption for one year i don't know if that was done by you that calculation so that is one thing and uh, to uh, abhishek here like um, yeah it was almost 20 plus minutes like uh, and we were still uh, in capacity estimation and i think abhishek was trying to ask some questions around design and uh, databases like i think he was trying to get some answers and uh, maybe he he is pushing to make to some decisions during the capacity estimation i get his intent but like uh, like uh, yeah this is my view like we spent almost like 20 plus minutes and we didn't get to high level design and um, yeah i mean the block pictures that you have done chaitanya is uh, pretty good and you are pretty fast in drawing as well uh, so and that is good and um, one thing i is good to have and is um, missing um, in this design is a data modeling so you are saying like db db that's pretty high level um, 
I would like to know what um, users data or like what flights table will have. And um, there is a booking table missing, like what booking information is going to have. And uh, yeah, I mean, like if you, if you draw, I mean, like if you put all those key columns, then you get some more questions and like some more thoughts on how, uh, what are issues you are going to have. So yeah. So that data model thing was missing. And I think um, using optimistic blocks and uh, I think Mohan or uh, Mohan, he was trying to uh, um, think about like snapshot isolation, like which is, which uses this optimistic one, like, uh, yeah, bringing that would have also been more clearer, but like, yeah, I think optimistic locking, I know, I, I think everyone knows. So we let, uh, concurrent transactions happen and uh, successfully finish only one. And I think that overall this was good. And finally, I don't know if you have validated to make sure all the requirements were satisfied. So that is one another good thing to do at the end of your interview when uh, Abhishek asked you, is there anything else you like to add on or say? Yeah, but otherwise I think you did a um, pretty good job all across. So good conversation between uh, Abhishek and you and he was trying to ask clarifications whenever you say something. Yeah. I think uh, uh, I, I'm also having the similar feedback, uh, but uh, first of all, uh, I, I would like to add kudos to Chaitanya for uh, really good head writing. So I like the, uh, I really like what I'm right now seeing on the screen. If you're in my team, I always piggyback on you. Like, hey, can you do a whiteboard for me? So, so uh, nicely and neatly drawn things, uh, which is uh, a good bonus point. And uh, I think uh, overall, uh, overall, uh, like Naga mentioned, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time in capacity estimation. If if I generally don't uh, generally jump to capacity estimation, I generally start with high level diagram. So it gives me more clarity of thoughts. And then during that, when I'm in the DB component, I can talk about uh, my entities and uh, I can talk about uh, what could be a capacity based on capacity like what kind of load based on that i can decide okay or i can say uh, to start with i can start with relational if i have more load i can uh, eventually move to different technology or something like that and uh, bringing uh, uh, elastic i think there is a question on why we want to use elastic search so uh, a good Rational, like okay, for any search, Elastic Search is good, but uh, Elastic Search is mostly for uh, free text search. It index things really well, but do we need here? That's a question. It, because uh, for an airline thing, do we need a free text search, or it will always be like a filter from this city to this city, this time to this time, and this this this? I want some results, so. It could be like a, any database could also handle that, or I can have a cache of, of things which are really popular. So I'm just adding some more points where uh, could we have a different conversation around different components. And uh, and there was a, a conversation on why, whether we want distributed systems or not. I think, again, if... Uh, the high level diagram could have bring in really soon then we can talk about hey i'm looking for a, a let's see how based on the requirements how it goes and looks like we have different components like payment search and this thing i want to be distributed i want like to be microservices architecture and event based architecture where one component talk to another component so these things could so like uh, I, I I think we always talk like we need to take uh, the interviewer to a ride and that ride would come when we are on a vehicle and the vehicle could be like uh, different components or a high level diagram and rather than having more things verbally, let's keep on drawing and get clarified. So I think uh, that's all from my side.
Okay, cool. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a quick question. I, I think as I said, I really like the you know diagrams and writing. So what? So are you using a pen to write on a tablet, or, or like is it just a mouse pointer? Because the overall drawing quality looks pretty good. Uh, yeah, I have a digital a drawing pen and digital pen with me. Oh, so you write on a drawing pad and that uh, connected to your computer. Laptop. Yes. Yes. Okay, looks good. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> so, uh, hi, can you hear me? This is Pravin again. Yeah. So, I have one feedback. Like uh, initially, during the uh, gathering of the requirements, uh, you can actually add one more section there that uh, areas that are not needed as part of this design or not covered as part of this design. Um, though you discuss that but it's good to actually document it saying that okay payment services even though considered but it's not needed as part of this or support or authentication or any of those scenarios right uh, it is out of scope for this out of syllabus kind of <laughs> for this uh, system design you can add that in your list and second thing is um, uh, i liked is uh, one more uh, is one point you there's a question that I'm a startup company and I don't have that many resources, right? That's a very key question in most of the system designs uh, from what I learned is uh, based on your uh, resources availability and your uh, expertise and the time to market, right? If your time to market is immediately, your implementation or your design will be different than if your time to market is two years down the line versus time to market is uh, one month or two months down the line, correct? Your approach will be different. So based on that, you, you can also add one more section there, like what is the time to market? Uh, because many of the best, best practices you can't implement if your time to market is uh, very soon. So Google, when they actually implement something, they don't implement, uh, they implement time to market as quickly as possible, and then they have different iterations to make it scale out. They do initial scale out, but the time to market is key. So when the interviewer asks you like, uh, um, I'm, I'm not a rich company or I need to get it done. So the, then you can say that based on this design of I need to get it done quickly, I will use this as a trade-off for getting the work done quickly. But if I had more time and come back later, then I will add this, um, do something differently. So that way interviewer will know that you can look at the things both from a uh, short term and also from a long term perspective. Yeah, that's one thing I just realized. That's good to have, know. So I have a difference in, uh argument here uh, where I don't uh, recommend spending a lot of uh, sections in requirements. Uh, it's good to clarify things, but not but if you're spending too much time on requirements itself, creating a lot of section or this thing is needed or that thing is not, then we can end up like 10, 15 minutes in requirements only. And I think uh, here Chitanya did a good job asking, hey, uh, these things I've covered. Do you think anything on your mind which I should focus? If no, let's go further. So he quickly moved uh, things, but uh, but again, uh, it got uh, stuck somewhere in the capacity estimation. So I think, yeah, so that is my point of view. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Sim on this. I, I think uh, the, uh, my opinion is that, uh, again, it's my opinion, and the requirements, trying to hit one or two key points. I think as long as you hit some crucial key point in the requirement, I think it's, it's okay. I, th yeah. I don't think we need to do an exhaustive list of requirements. I think we'll easily waste 10 minutes if we do that. Yeah, even then, I agree. I agree to that too. It depends on the interviewer, right? Which right. Uh, which which rat hole the interviewer wants to take the interviewer right. in. Right. Whether True. it's uh, the performance or capacity or uh, services, most of the people will be just concentrating on um, how many services will you create? What is the services post or get or what should be the minimum attributes? And sometimes when you get into that rat hole of uh, 
what the service should look like then the whole interview will be just be concentrating of okay i just want you to look into search service search service what should it contains request response or and then attributes and then you can it completely goes into a different direction so no, it all depends on interview yeah, yeah. and exactly. that's a good point yeah it's a good point and that like it could have been good to discuss like what are different search parameters and i mean like those search parameters are likely the search indexes right like i don't know if you select search or like we in the database itself have um the replicas of database which serve this that would, that would have been enough given the scale like instead of elastic search cluster also the because yeah, in some I, I, of the interviews yeah. i did ask uh, those kind of questions my most of my interviews went inside that redis search service booking service and i think 45 minutes we just spent on that one <laughs> search service and booking service in one of my interviews okay similar kind not the same but similar kind mm -hmm. okay uh, great uh, yeah i think it was really good feedback most of the things were really covered uh, so chetanya now i'll start my feedback i'll probably take little more time i'll start from the very beginning like where you started step by step what are the things you, i liked and what are the things i was expecting and then yeah you can probably stop me or yeah we can discuss more so you started with functional requirements and uh, i really liked your way of gathering the functional requirements they were concise in the sense i didn't see that you missed anything and i didn't see that you were spending too much time on like talking about the things which were not very important to me uh, you also talked about that hey there are these different kind of payment services and all do we want to design that or could be leverage third party so those were really good questions and you also uh, i could see also that you were stretching out a little bit like your functional requirements were not too much constrained also that you talked about these optional requirement notification service and analytics which which makes me feel like you have worked on these big system big systems which need these kind of analytics and notification kind of services right so that was really good uh, now moving on to you move to non functional requirements right so uh, in non functional requirements as i think uh, naga has also mentioned like uh, so the one thing is that the numbers like you took the numbers but i didn't see that you were doing too much with the numbers so like let's say i told you that the number of people searching are 100k uh, every day right so now what does this translate to every request per second like do you think that a single machine can handle that many request or do we need multiple machines to handle those request right uh, and so when we talked about the capacity estimation right i intentionally wanted uh, the overall system to sit on uh, to fit on a single machine because yeah with most of the system design interviews we are always talking about hey there is huge amount of data we need to distribute it i wanted to take it to a different direction that why do we actually need to distribute the data is it because it's too much that's why we need distributed systems or are there other reasons so in this case my focus was i was again and again asking i was again and again poking you do we need the distributed system for this and basically there uh, there are multiple reasons why we need distributed systems which i did not get the right answer for you from you so one thing is that this is very important data right your flight information your users have booked the flights so all this information should be durable right so durability means that you have to replicate your data among multiple machines so that you are not losing your data this second point is even if your data fits on one machine let's say i have only like let's say 50, 50 mb of data which fits on a single machine but let's say i have like 100000 request happening every second right so again in that scenario also i my single machine cannot serve so it's not just about the data size it's also the request and so that's why i would have really liked if you would have uh taken that number how many requests we are getting every day and translated into request per second and then calculated whether like a single machine can serve it or not but 
I, I mean, with this number, a single machine could have served it. So then we fall back to these other reasons, right? That we want the durability of data. We don't want a single point of failure. And these are the reasons uh, we would need a distributed system in this scenario, right? So, yeah, so this was about this overall functional requirement, non-functional requirement and capacity estimation. And that's why I think it's a fault on my end where everyone is saying that uh, you should have drawn a high level design. I was stopping you. I wanted to ask those questions. I thought those questions are very important that do we actually need a distributed system? And that's why I spent some time with you over there. Okay. So before I move on to the other parts, any questions up till here? Um, um, just, uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, actually I, I have not done capacity estimation before. So, um, I mean, when you were uh, asking me here, I was uh, struggling uh, with the capacity estimation. So, uh, should I, uh, I mean, uh, for having the capacity estimation, um, I mean, is it a good time to actually talk about different entities and the, the different sizes of those entities or just let's like, like we just went ahead with hundred bytes. So, uh, see, uh, the point is user information, user attributes, like we know what are the basic information, user information will almost remain same in all the systems, right? So that's why nobody wants to focus on like what are the kind of user attributes you're storing. That's why I said that assume it's 100 byte, but the more important thing which is related to this system design is what are the information related to airlines? So related to flights, what is the information like source city, destination city, date, number of seats. Those are the things that you could have discussed because those are specific to this problem. And th that is something which is not generic, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would, so as Naga was mentioning, so there, if you would have spent a little bit of time on how your database actually schema would have looked like, what kind of information you are storing in database, that would have been more helpful and that would have been given you more clarity on how you're designing your system. And I think it's about practice. If you will do some practice, it will not take much time. I think because you have not done too much practice in, in this side, you were a little hesitant that if I will, so like for number of users and everything, like if you could have actually done those estimations here, then like it could have shown that you have some experience and you're confident in that aspect. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on to this, uh, moving on to the design that you made, right? So, uh, so, and again, so, Oh yeah, one important thing about availability and consistency. So you talked about availability and consistency. You said that availability is more important to you than consistency. But I think in this booking kind of a system, uh, consistency is more important than availability. But so here, yeah, again, you remember I asked you this question that are you talking about high latency availability in terms of all the features of this service or are, are you talking about some components? So see what I meant there is and like audience here, they can correct me, but see, uh, so the things about when you are searching, right? When you're searching for flights, that is a system that should be highly available. Really available. Yeah. And right, because it should be... yeah, there you don't want and there, if your system is eventually consistent, Eventually consistent means that you are seeing some flights which are available, but actually those flights are not available. You're seeing some stale information, the information which is not up to date. It's okay because even if you have showed most up-to-date information, what if the user was viewing the page and by the time he decided to book the flight, that flight got booked, right? So that's why some delays over there, it's not very important. So that should be highly available. But the point when you're booking, your booking system should be highly consistent then availability, right? Because there, if you are like, you have some stale information and if you're booking two, two seats uh, for this, uh, booking same seat for two customers, then you're creating a problem. But I really like the uh, approach or either you could have explained the approach, which I think Praveen has mentioned, or I don't know that, like you could have dealt with those kind of situations if you would have talked about 
hey, that if I take a consistency hit on this booking system, then I will have some mechanism where I will detect that I have booked a uh, same seat for multiple flights and I will, uh, I will off then give an offline notification. So either you should have talked like that, that could be one approach because in system design, there is no, no one right approach, right? So that is also one way to deal with the system. So then you would have asked me, do you want to go like this? Or the other thing is that my system during the booking, it might be sometimes unavailable, the unavailability might be low, but I will make sure that the bookings are always consistent. So that was my take on this availability and consistency. And that's why there I asked you some questions that what component are you talking about? Uh, okay, so now talking about this search, the high level diagram that you made. So in this high level diagram, so one thing, uh, you said is that authentication and authorization will be in the load balancer. And mm -hmm. I, the load balancers are generally very lightweight. They, they are just based on, based on IP address that how to divide the traffic. So load balancers don't have this authentication and authorization kind of logic. It's, it's the application service, authentication application service that have this uh, kind of logic. I don't have like too much experience working with load balancer, but this is what my understanding is. Uh, people on the call, if I'm incorrect, let me know. So that was one part. Then the other part was using the elastic search, right? So again, I asked you questionnaire. So again, my understanding is that, uh, so when you are, which I think Asim has also mentioned, and I agree with Asim that, uh, so elastic search is something that when you have kind of unorganized data, non-structured data, when you have full text, you want to index your text. In those situations, you use el elastic search. Here, I think like just, uh, I mean, your data is very schematized, very organized way. So you could have, you could have used the indexes of your database. I did not see the need of Elasticsearch, but yeah, I, I like, I don't know deeply like how, what are the advantages of Elasticsearch on a schema based database? Like my understanding has been that they are mostly used for full text indexes and all those things. So, um, and then talking about this cache, you talked about this Redis cache that you will cache a request, which was good because we have a lot of requests. And then the good thing, which I really liked is that you also talked about invalidating the cache that once when the write happens, then those seats are no longer booked. So your cache should be invalidated, right? So that thing was good. Uh, moving on to this booking system, uh, so in this booking system, again, like there was some confusion about this database, right? Uh, like same database or different database. So yeah, I think we, yeah, it's that same database we are using and in that same database we are searching. And basically the thing is now we can say that on the same database, we are having so much read load and write load. So probably you have divided your read load by using the cache, right? So your cache is helping you not putting too much load during the reads, right? So, and using the same database and using the cache, you could have uh, used this search and booking on this same database, right? Uh, so that was that. Uh, and yeah, then I think overall, I think we ran out of time, but yeah, like my, again, the next question about uh, this replication and sharding the questions which I were asking was that, so basically in this scenario, we are, our rights were okay, right? Number of rights. But when I talked about when we are scaling up, when we have large number of customer and large number of rights, what happens, right? So basically the problem with replication is Replication helps you scale reads, but replication does not help you scale writes, right? Because so 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 that's why if you have to scale your writes, then you need to shard your data. And how you shard your data, you have to shard your data so that uh, basically you try to optimize in such a way that your one shard is able to fulfill your one request as much as possible. So basically the point is if you're reading reading from those shards right so mm -hmm. 
you, you, you're reading what are the flights available. So basically, let's say if you're sharding in such a way that your data for same source and destination lives on one shard, then the advantage we see here is that now if you want to get the flights, if user is searching for the flights, one shard can serve it. Whereas if your data is not sharded in this way, then you would have to go to multiple shards to get the data, which is not good. So those were some sharding techniques. I wanted to ask you what will be those sharding techniques, why we actually need the sharding to scale rights, right? So those were other things which I would want, have wanted to ask, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I mean, overall, I would say that it was a good interview. You have some knowledge about things and I think you need more practice and I think you need some deeper understanding of these components, I mean, I yeah like and like once yeah once you have more practice and once you have deeper understanding I think yeah then we could have done even more better. Okay, yeah, thanks thanks for the detailed feedback, Abhishek. Yeah, thanks Abhishek. That was detailed feedback. Yeah. And. Yeah, Chaitanya, you have any questions or clarifications or like, um, or anyone else, feel free to get their yeah. thoughts. Um, can I go ahead? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, so sorry, there's an ambulance, just a minute. Yeah, it's gone. One second. Yeah, sorry. Um, so first of all, um, when I was on the load balancer section and um, I mean, I just wanted to say that whatever authentication authorization mechanisms are there, um, I mean, uh, we can have a separate service that handles, I mean, directly a call from the load balancer is being made there. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, you were quite right with that. But uh, then I, I'll just mention that uh, I'll just have a reverse proxy and a load balancer there instead of talking about more uh, authorization and authentication there. Um, secondly, um, I mean, as everyone has this same feedback, um, I was struggling with the capacity estimation there and I should have uh, um, pointed out the entities there. And um, uh, for, for the database, um, I mean, I, to be very frank, I was a bit lost when uh, um, I was told to have it on a single system and then think of having it on multiple systems. So uh, regarding uh, this situation, how should uh, the interviewee deal with this? I mean, uh, what questions should he ask uh, or what questions I could have asked uh, when scaling up this application, scaling up the database? Uh, so like, I mean, what, what, like, what was the confusion there when I said that we need to scale the number of users and everything is increasing? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, when, I mean, scaling of reads was fine. Uh, but I mean, I talked about adding slaves and having more, uh, maybe nodes, replica nodes, but, uh, let's say I want to scale rights. So mm. how can, uh, I mean, one scale rights. I mean, I, I just talked about multiple master strategy, but I mean, to be very frank, I was not sure of this strategy. So I didn't go much deep into it or I wasn't, I was hesitant to speak about it actually. Yeah, so scaling rights. So uh, by sh sharding the data, so like how you scale rights is. So, uh, so let's say you shard the data in such a way that, uh, so let's say for this source and destination, uh, this, data base will be serving the request for this source and this destination, this database will be serving the request, right? So now whenever you have to make any bookings for the flights between that source and source, uh, between one source and another destination, then you are just going to that database, right? Mm -hmm. the, the problem with replication is because the data is replicated, so you have to update it in all the nodes. So whenever you're writing, your rights have to be updated in all the nodes. So your load has actually not divided during the write because replication helps you dividing the load during the read, 
because you can read from one of the nodes, but when you have to write, you have to write in all the nodes, right? So that's why it does not help you with write scaling, but with sharding, because you have given individual responsibility to each shard that one shard is responsible for this type of data, one shard is. So that's why you can, you just need to write to that shard. Okay. Um... So I need, I want to add one thing. Uh, you said you want to scale out writing, right? Yeah. Um, so there you need to take into consideration two things. First thing is whether uh, you want, you're expecting something to come back or is it an offline process, right? Sometimes during some payment services, there's a right service you want to do and immediately you want the customer to know that, hey, you're, it's pass or fail. Or is it some process in the workflow that you don't want immediate response. So you can immediately put that in a queue and go back and do the processing in the back end later and just say 200 good, we are processing on it. So it depends on uh, how you want to, uh, whether you want to take some information and immediately return it or whether it's just a back end fire and forget. So that should be the consideration of, uh, and then based on those question, right? those information you can use whether you want to use sharding or you want to use immediate or uh, what kind of uh, backend you want to use strategy you want to use is based on the usage or the what the interviewer says that i want the customer to write and immediately get the response and write and forget uh, that will decide upon some of the strategies lower strategies that you can further ask okay yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Praveen. Um, okay, Chaitanya, you have anything else to clarify or discuss? Uh, no. Okay. Um, okay, I think we are almost time. So if there is nothing else, we can stop and like we can call for volunteers for upcoming weeks. Let me just... I want to ask one question. Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Go ahead, Bumi. I think uh, it's uh, kind of related to optimistic locking. I'm not really familiar with that. Hence, I'm putting it out there. But whenever uh -huh. we go and book on some uh, airline system for any reservations, we say that we see that, hey, your seats are kind of blocked for five minutes. Book it within that time, and we will guarantee you that your seats will be there for you. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, how, how, how does that happen? Because what we were talking in optimistic locking right now is that we will have two parallel transactions going on and whichever finishes first will succeed. So if the system wants to give this kind of assurance that I, for next five minutes, I am guaranteeing you that this seats will be yours if you book. Yeah, for that, it's not like specifically, I mean, like this uh, optimistic, uh, I mean, like the snapshot isolation is where like it lets to uh, transactions uh, run concurrently and uh, it, I mean, like one of them wins. But in this case, like if they're giving like five to seven minutes guarantee, then in that case, like you have to use uh, explicit write lock. I mean, like with, I mean, like there will be, I think maybe they use this concept of semaphores, like where, um, the number of seats are like the number of uh, units like and one of them you are guaranteeing for this user for this time and then it automatically like if something happens within that time and he didn't book so then i mean like it automatically becomes available for other users so i can uh, i can add one thing yeah so sure. here, right? sometimes when you're it's like a airline reservation or movie tickets reservation right you see that only two uh, two hotel rooms available or one flight ticket available. And then two people are guaranteeing that, hey, if you book in next 15 minutes, it will be done. If you have 10 reservations available and two people are booking. So when you say this thing is blocked for like one day or six hours, they actually put a flag there. It's This is what they do in Expedia and uh, Priceline. They put a uh, flag there saying that, and automatically they have a trigger that looks for the flag and removes it and puts it back in the queue. So if you are temporary, the, the pre-authorized and temporary, they put it in 
they remove from the queue so if you put that uh, one tick one ticket is blocked then they put nine tickets left out of ten and within one day if you don't book that then again that one ticket will come back and come back to the pool so they have a triggers that they run every day so it's a temporary they will remove from the pool of availability and they add it back and always write when you're booking uh, if you if one ticket is there and two people are booking so at that scenario is a race condition not race condition uh, is a condition where from the front end you you will say that you are the last one and who is getting it you don't know so you have to be very critical in the last uh, few ticket scenarios uh, that's completely different logic that you have to use yeah i mean like it's basically to maintain that pool of availability i think is what boomik is uh, asking i mean like i think yeah. i assume it's kind of i mean like if you in a threading world if i mean like the way database connections are maintained right their fixed number i think we they use concept of semaphores i think which can um maintain this kind of uh, pool and uh, it will automatically decrement when one of them wins booking a seat so that count keeps uh, getting decreased so i think there will be similar Raga, do, do you have any example which database use semaphore i mean though i'm not sure but uh, yeah. i'm thinking from the system resource point of view of using the semaphore for each request will be i mean exhaust all the resources yeah, yeah. i mean like it no no, no. i mean like i think it's uh, just a thing right like concurrency if you have a single database and all of this uh, if it has to maintain a number of connection then it has to use some kind of operating system resources right like which are like uh, semaphores or uh, to maintain that threading conflict so if there is any other way apart from threading uh, i don't know okay i have yeah, and and pravin one question to you i mean you mentioned that the the kind of experience um, they use i mean they handle uh, the situation differently if the number of uh, uh, tickets or um, i mean go beyond under under some threshold level so they actually don't put the the flag on that and and directly uh, user can directly book they don't put the reservation on those is that correct yeah so one thing is right uh, this in this in airline scenario the airlines and the booking system are same whereas if you are uh, expedia or priceline you are aggregator service right so you mm-hmm. are calling from uh, lufthansa you are calling from delta you are calling from american airlines so you don't have control so you are just you know that so every time they have to pull so once you get to the last threshold like last 10 seats available uh and there's another different pricing logic for each available but when they they preemptively they warn the customer that uh, you may not get the seat sometimes till the transaction is over so when they actually uh, are in the end and they click on the submit they actually send that uh, api to the back end and they block the reservation they temporarily block it so that you don't uh, second transaction so if two persons are contending for the same seat first one the moment the transaction goes in the back end they just lock it so the database from a database point of view it is just either it's uh, this is available or not available it's just a binary flag zero or one there is no other thing and then once the so the ticket if it's uh, confirmed or in pending state it's open confirm a pending right if it's pending state so if anything status changes to the pending to cancel then automatically the the boolean of zero will turn back to one so from a availability point of view the it's very simple either zero one and from a status perspective there is another triggers that happen between uh, available pending cancelled or you know confirmed so there's a workflows there so based on the workflows the availability will change so they made it very simple and and even when they are actually uh, aggregating it they are actually doing some logic uh, so to so to, and- to roll roll back those flags so they do keep actually uh, 
that information somewhere or some uh, run some daemon process and keep that information somewhere in a, some table so that daemon can read the information to make sure that whether those are those uh, request has been matured or is still pending so that we i can roll back yeah so automatically this trigger happens so the moment ca customer uh, says that hey um, sorry i don't want it right after 2 hours he'll get back sorry the time is not available you'll cancel it right so the moment the cancellation comes um, the flag will automatically trigger a deep event or uh, not deep event sorry a kafka event and the event will actually set that flag to 0 to 1 available so that ticket comes back if the event so this is all back end process right from customer oh, so 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 you are saying that when somebody put a reservation so uh, the system um, their expedia system put some some sort of a message in a queue and when that message uh, will trigger only after uh, say like whatever uh, predefined time frame they have yeah no no it will always trigger yeah some of them are predefined some of them they already send the queue which will be processed after some time so they have this preemptive queuing uh, not uh, this is generic in expedia or priceline or anything preemptive queuing and they will actually set that flags so so, so when you say flag you, you are you talking about like a database it's it's a, it's a column in the database of the tickets yes yeah okay so this this uh, change of flag available non available but actual uh, ticket status whether it is like reserved booked waiting for booking that, that is a table. separate column separate column that's a separate table so there's a trigger that happens the moment the main table uh, changes the ticketing status then this available non available for that ticket that seat number this this applies to uh, movie reservations also okay um, same same logic so so basically there is a table just for availability and then there is a yeah. table with the overall seat information yeah and then order information yeah yeah so yeah, if yeah, at the yeah. moment order gets cancelled yeah so same logic, right? It's all available, non-available, and then you change it. So if you see, if we rat hole into this side of the system design, then there's yeah. so many areas open up. You'll just like a can of worms. Right. And then going back to Chetan's question, when when they display like, you know, it's a five minute timer or something like that, it means they just uh, change the availability, uh, just an available table for five minutes, right? To non-available. Yeah. So, so there, right, availability and also price match. Sometimes when you say, if you book in next five, five minutes, the, this price is set. So uh, and if you change beyond five minutes, like now the ticket is like $500. Okay. After uh, five minutes, what they do is they get another refresh of from the back end. Uh, right. And they do from the back end the price search. So based on the availability, they have algorithms. So now after, if tickets are... 100 tickets are available, price is $500. But if 10 tickets are available, price is $800. So, and if you have five minutes locked, then it's locked. And then they lock everything, pre-order everything. The moment the five minutes open, they release the lock. The ticket goes back into the pool and the transaction, the cancellation workflow will trigger. And and this uh, timer is it is it is it running part of the database itself on on a, on a, on a per row basis or no, is it... database is database is very dumb. Database okay. so outside service is running that lock basically yeah some service exactly okay. database only stores information and multiple databases run uh, okay. one is just to store the information and read and write databases are hey, completely Praveen. different yeah uh, sorry to stop you like uh, I think this is a very good information would you like to present it next week at least so that like um, it will be good to know like how this uh, thing works in detail yeah i yeah i can not next week but a couple of weeks later i will do that um, okay. yeah i think this is really good information but like i don't want to rush in this uh, yeah 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 sure definitely yeah thanks praveen um okay let me stop recording